I have a, um, a slightly different perspective, so let me introduce myself one more time and say that uh, I came to this country by choice uh, because I wanted to be part of uh, something that is unique and special. Um, growing up in India, I came here to get uh, advanced uh, education here, thinking that I wanted to be part of uh, a leadership in science. And I went to Oak Ridge for the same reason. My, my thesis work was uh, uh, essentially understanding surface tension-driven flows in materials processing. So you qualify, say, for example, stainless steel. You say that it's an allowable uh, amount of sulfur in the parts per million. And it turns out that within the variability that is allowed by the specs, you can have widely ranging performance. And that was part of my PhD. And I had run out of my ability to perform that science to completion. And uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory gave me an opportunity to be a postdoc. And the reason I went to Oak Ridge at the time was, uh, again, it was at a, a tipping point just like it is now, that we were, as a, as a te technology-wise and as a nation, we were transitioning from single processor, large vector computing to the first instantiation of massively parallel processors. And that enabled my science to go forward. Um, and, and, and here I am 25 years later, uh, still continuing to not only perform science uh, every once in a while when I get a chance, but also encourage uh, uh, computational science. I want to add that when I went to Oak Ridge National Laboratory 25 years ago, computational science was a, a minority in the sense that I, we were specialists. Today, if you think about the, 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 the students that graduate, they expect computational science as part of scientific discovery, uh, co-equal with theory and, and experiments. And that's really fundamentally different than when I went there. When I started my career, computational science was validating hypothesis that was developed through experimentation. Today, computation and experimentation goes, go hand in hand, and tomorrow, uh, computation will lead experiments because these experiments are going to be difficult to do or very expensive to perform. So um, Tom um, gave you, Tom Dunning gave you a, a, an overview of the, the current state. What I've done is to, is to really pick few examples of really great science that's being performed by users that use uh, computers. At Oak Ridge, uh, we are really proud that we, as, we support Department of Energy's leadership computing facility, Jaguar, but also the National Science Foundation, NOAA, and, and, and some uh, DOD uh, computers as well. And by and large, our goal through these user facilities is to facilitate science, both at Oak Ridge, but also the broader scientific community. And what you see here is a snippet of uh, uh, breakthrough science that simply could not have been done without the computational capability that we have today uh, available to us. So from, from understanding how high temperature uh, superconductivity works so that we can design materials to, to tailor the property so that you can bring the supercon superconducting temperature lower it to or, or raise it to room temperature so that you can actually uh, drive uh, the materials development, which is, helps in tra uh, energy transmission, minimize losses, but also have high density transmission. The other thing is really work by Jeremy Smith, where you're designing new enzymes that break down uh, cellulosic material. You are basically you know that, uh, especially if you had trouble spots, wa uh, waterlogged spots in your home, termites can get to, to basically wood, convert to sugars, and, and then from there to ethanol or, or butanol. Well, what we are trying to do is to develop uh, and create enzymes that can convert uh, cellulosic material to, to biofuels. Understand uh, climate change. In this particular sense, in case, you're looking at the earth breathing um, as you uh, uptake carbon dioxide and then release it. Uh, looking at fusion, we are supporting the EDA project. And make, it's, a, it's a several billion dollar experiment. You want to lead that experiment with computation and simulation. And likewise, some, some of these fundamental sciences. But we also work with industry. Um, Tom Dunning touched on uh, uh, the Boeing example, so I will not talk about it, but the General Motors example is one where we worked uh, with General Motors 
to develop thermoelectric materials so that you can convert about the 70% of energy that is lost as heat through the exhaust, and convert it to electricity so that you can drive a hybrid powertrain. But perhaps I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the BMI corporation activity. This is one where I will tell you flat out that you don't need all the capability that we have to run this analysis. However, because we have the user program, we allow the industry to have access to this. This is a small uh, company in, in South Carolina, and they had a great idea of designing and retrofitting airfoils on these big tractor trailers. We have about 1.2 million tractor trailers uh, in this country. We add about 300,000 each year. Hopefully, we are also losing some to, to old age. The average uh, miles per gallon is about six miles per gallon for the fleet. And they, because of this is a roughly few hundred dollar uh, retrofit, it actually increases the efficiency by by 10 to 15 percent. It's a five billion dollar savings fleet-wide per year and about 80,000 pounds of uh, CO2 emission that is uh, minimized per truck. It's, it's a kind of impact that you would not otherwise envision if you did not have the ecosystem of high performance computing available to, uh, to industry. There are many compelling uh, uh, problems that become tractable at the exascale. And these, I would not go into the details, I just want to let you know how we arrived at it. Uh, we went through uh, almost a three year long process, uh, kicked off uh, uh, this exascale town hall meeting back in 2007, and we had topical workshops in these areas where we invited the scientific community, both experimentalists, theorists, and computational scientists from the broad walk scientific uh, arena, and we went through, stepped through these various application areas, defining the problem. What are the compelling problems that we can solve if you had capabilities uh, at the exascale? And even though, as Tom pointed out, this is an enormous capability, I can assure you that when I started 25 years ago, if somebody told me that you would have a petascale computer and you could actually compute on it, I would have said there is no way because my imagination could not have uh, stretched from one, one processor to, two, to about 200,000 processors that we use at the moment. So what I want to mention to you is that there's been a rigor in arriving at the, at the plan for exascale computing. This is an exemplar of one of, the, one of the areas in nuclear energy where we have used those workshops to define the, the spatial and, and scientific challenges that we can overcome at the exascale so that we can in, improve our understanding of, uh, of this important technology. And as many of you know, uh, uh, this is uh, the castle is uh, the innovation hub uh, that DOE awarded as part of uh, um, the, the, the last year's budget, which really focuses on creating next generation computational tools that runs on these exascale machine so that we can do high fidelity simulation and uh, so that we can understand the performance of this, uh, uh, this important energy technology in different scenarios. And so uh, I basically want to close by saying that uh, computational capability has been increasing. There are some fundamental challenges that you're going to hear again uh, from the other panelists. But we are at a tipping point where there's a convergence of theory, uh, computational science, and experimentation that will allow us to move the science forward in a fundamentally new way. Thank you very much.